I was just looking back on the first episode, you know, and the very first content that we put out, we were recording and Mark, you phoned Martin halfway through our recording <laughs> and Martin turns to the camera and shows your name popping up. It's come yeah. full circle now. It's absolutely mad to oh, have I you on. That's but... a great link. Because yeah. I went, I've got to knock him back for this blog. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm like> that. <laughs> it's like priorities, Martin, priorities. Priorities, yeah, yeah, that's what it is now. These and the individuals in them. Um... I've got, you realize I've got to knock him back. <laughs> I've got to speak to him. I'm busy. All right. Come on, speak him. Hello everyone, welcome to the final Whistle blog again, our uh, episode 17, this free content we're putting out particularly down lockdown. For those of you with eagle eyes, we're absolutely honoured and privileged to have the amazing Mark Clattenberg with us today. It's like, welcome to the blog, mate. Thank you for having me. And you're over in Greece at the moment? Yeah, I'm back. I've just uh, finished my quarantine period at the, um, because when I came back from England and all of the strains that are out in England with the COVID. I had to self-isolate when I come back to Greece and now I'm back in the office doing some work. Um, but it's like my job anyways, I can watch many matches from on TV, so it didn't impact on my job, but it's just nice to be able to go out and about. Yeah, yeah we're not yeah. at all jealous that you're in Athens and we're no, in Merseyside no, and no. Northumberland. And I, don't, I wouldn't say that at the moment. I think every, every country is the same. Okay, the weather may be a bit different, but every country is the same. It's... You know, with this COVID, everybody's having big trouble. Everything's in lockdown here. So even though Greece look, sounds a great place at the moment, it's very difficult with everybody really worried about what's going to happen next. Yeah. Your fellow Georgie, what's the weather like up there, mate? Well, we've got about a foot of snow here and I have no idea what it's like in, in concert up where. Obviously, Mark knows very, very well. It'll probably be two or three foot up there. Yeah, of course it will be. I think... Uh, I think my daughter's school, she, she's based in Durham. And uh, I think a few of the, 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 her, her friends live on the outskirts of Durham and they're, they're, they're in thickness of snow. So up towards concert, Towlaw, the good old Towlaw. Oh. And all these, all these places out in the wilds of Wanny will be uh, all in snow. So it'll be uh, quite picturesque because very well we'll have snow. I mean, so it's nice that we can have Oh, yeah, no, the trees are looking, looking very beautiful. Hey, listen, mate, we want, we want to start with the real hard-hitting questions that I know it's going to be on everyone's lips to what to ask you. What do you think of coloured whistles? <laughs> <laughs> that is a hard-hitting question, I think. Uh, I, was, I was always, you know what? I, I, they brought all these multi-coloured ones, which I thought was meant for, like, the same colour as your referee's top. Um, and Kalina changed all this with all these coloured tops and the Italians, and then all of a sudden the coloured whistles, but... I was always a black, black whistle man. Uh, oh, I love you even more. Class. Right, we'll, uh, we'll end the uh, podcast now then. Uh, I, I thought you knew about refereeing. But... <laughs> you know, refereeing, you know what? I always said refereeing should be always, uh, I always like dressing in black. Look, I'm in black for your, your podcast. And here. Nice. Um, but no, black black was always the referee's colour. And I, my, my whistle always sounded stupid anyways. Everybody used to comment saying I used to blow my whistle differently and I never used to realise so it must have been the way you blow them, but um, always there was different types of whistles, but I just used the whistle that I got for nothing, me. I was never going to buy one. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone mad now, whistles, though. You can get like 50, 60, 70 quid whistles, and people are like, it's a, a whistle's a whistle at the end of the day. It makes it's a sound. Can you hear it? Yes or no? But yeah, a, a couple of quid sorted. No worries. Jobs are good. It does the same job, man. It stops the game. That's all you need. A whistle to stop the game. Yeah, mate. Totally agree, and preferably a black one. But neon is yeah. fine. We we uh, but but totally with you on that. <laughs> Give us a tip for those grassroots referees out there, maybe just starting on a little tip about like what you what you believe a good whistle is and and how your whistle talks and stuff like that, mate. Give give a little bit out there. Interesting because you know certainly when you get high and you mix with different nationalities and people who don't speak much English it, it, it's easy when you, you can communicate with your voice of course but when you start dealing with um, people who can't speak English then your whistle can do lots of different things how you blow it um, I think you're always taught even when you were a grassroots referee that 
uh, for a bad foul, you would whistle it a little bit more. If it was just a normal foul, you could just give it a small peep. Um, so by the tone of your whistle, could could deem to the players what level of foul it was. So yes, you have your cards, your red and yellow cards, um, but um, the way you blew your whistle was always a good a good indication of what was going to happen next. Because um, certainly, if it was a bad foul, the way you you know you give it a big blast, which meant whoa, that's that's a warning. Um, so it can do a lot of talking. Um, some people, you, the way you can whistle, it's not just blowing it once. You can actually double tone it um, just to you know to stop the game and and how you blow it. So um, I, I used to blow my bizarre, and everybody used to say that. People used to know even with blindfold who was refereeing the match because of the the way you blow your whistle. So I don't know why, but uh, I had a, a bizarre way of blowing my whistle. Never, still don't know why and how. But uh, I use the same whistle as everybody else. A black one, of course. A good, good boy, good boy. And one of the things I remember in a, an assessor picking up a, a ref on, and I thought, that's a, that's a good shout that. He said, you know what? Your loudest whistle today was offside. You blew mm-hmm. it longer and louder for any other decision that you've had three bookings in the sending off. And I always mm-hmm. stuck in my head. My, mine, was, mine was at the end of the game. So I blew it as hard as I can so everybody looked somewhere else and I ran off the pitch. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the games you've done, we, we were talking, the boys were talking about it. And we, we everyone knows what you've done. It's amazing achievements. But it's like we were talking about um, when you were coming through a grassroots level, so what are some of the real big games that were big to you coming through? And as we climbed the ladder, there's, we all have our own big games, don't we, at grassroots, good finals. And what, what was your first big one at a grassroots level, mate? Um, step by step, it, it, you can go right down to the bottom rung of the ladder and, and it could be just a youth youth cup final. Um, I can remember refereeing in the Whitby Bay tournament, a tournament that used to be played every every summer. Um, and just getting getting a final for that because it used to be played at Whitley Bay's uh, Hillheads, which was a proper stadium. So you've gone from a from a normal um, pitch that has a bit of grass or a pitch that has twelve pitches, for example, then going into a, a stadium with floodlights. It was like with dressing rooms. It was like wow. So you can start from the bottom rooms, and then you know what I used to do each year was I used to set myself some goals that were achievable because you you can't, for example have a grassroots referee thinking he's going to refer- dream that at the end of the season he's going to referee the FA Cup final. It's just not not practical and not achievable. So you used to be able to, each each year, set yourself some targets. And it could be, for example, uh, refereeing the county finals, youth finals, um, being able to, um, um, you know, for example, referee at the next level, get promoted, um, so yeah, I never, I never used to think too far ahead. Yes, I always wanted to be um, refereeing in the top level of, of English football, but that wasn't achievable at sixteen. And you don't know what's going to happen at sixteen because you can't. You're not a crystal ball and think, you know what? I'm going to look at twenty years ahead and think I'm going to referee in the Premier League. And if you think like that, that you'll probably end up failing or you'll get disillusioned because you might get five or six failures each season and gradually you're not getting promoted and then you get disillusioned. So I would always do it in bite sizes and think short term um, and then eventually you hopefully go through the different levels to eventually reach what you want to achieve. And I think every, every young referee or every young person wants to play football, but if they can't play football now, the way the English games moved with professional refereeing, young people want to be referees now. So it's a it's a career path, but not everybody's going to reach it. It's the same as a boss in a business. You know, you're an employee. You're not always going to reach the top if you if your company. So you need luck along the way. Um, and I had lots of luck um, in my in my career. One piece of luck was um, being a being an assistant referee in, in a not conference game. Um, Clive Oliver was the referee, Michael's father, and we all travelled together across to Barrow, and it was Russian and Diamonds, and Russian and Diamonds were um, one of the big sides in non, non, uh, non-league competitions. They eventually got promoted to the Football League and went financially bust, but they were playing Leeds, and the Drew were Leeds in the Cup, so they were playing Leeds in a replay, so there was big publicity on the game, and 
they were playing in Barrow and Clive. Um, I was the junior assistant, of course, and the, the senior assistant had said to us, Mark, um, you're a guy who has potential. And Donald McLeod, the assistant, was called and he said, why not you become assistant and remain assistant? Very rare it happens that the referee gets injured, but he thought, you've got better ch chance than me. <laughs> Lo and behold, after 15 minutes, Clive comes off and uh, I go on and I did really, really well and the game was normal, normally refereed and my first challenge was a yellow card, which was nice because it was clear and the game went well and I got a 10 out of 10 off the assessor and that's the look that you sometimes need to get elevated through because you you, you, you could be just a number in an organisation with 50, 60 referees wanting the same, but you need that little bit of luck along the way. Beautiful story, that. Yeah, oh, oh. yeah that's, that's, I'm, I'm just like, wow, take that in. Mm. Uh, that, that's an amazing advice. Take it in bite size season by season. Uh, if you, if you, yeah, if you roll with that, if you do well every season, if you achieve all your targets, then by the end of it, you, you're Mark Lattenberg. <laughs> or, like you say, if you're lucky, if you're lucky enough, you have a fantastic career. Kalina used to say to me, it's not about luck, it's about skill. But you need 90% skill, 10% luck. You need some luck along the way. And if you don't get any luck, um, it might not be for some, some, some grassroots referees that could be refereeing really well and not get an assessor to go to the game. You know, we used to know when we got assessors because when I was refereeing in the, 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 the Morbus Sunday League or the Cramlington Sunday League or the Blythe Sunday League, you knew the guy who was going to assess you because he had a jacket on with a hat on and he was hiding in the trees. <laughs> you know, I think it's changed now, but you would always look out for that, you know, the eagle eye with probably with binoculars and you think, hey, there, there's the assessor, you know. Yeah, and I was the Leeds manager who does that now. <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, you want to, um, one of the things I, I said, class, I want the boys to come in as well, you, but I remember you a couple of months ago when we got together in the Leisure Leagues um, headquarters when you're obviously you're a fantastic ambassador for Leisure Leagues. You were talking about a story about Kalina, you just mentioned him there, giving you some advice about what was going on with Pepe. He picked something up here, Pepe and tactics they were using. Do you remember that conversation? Yeah, that no, wasn't Pepe, it was uh, Thiago. Thiago, yeah. sorry mate, sorry, yeah. He's now at Liverpool and you know, it was just about understanding football and referees are have a guilty that they understand the laws of the game and they know the laws of the game inside out, or the majority do. Um, it, but it's not about, that's not enough anymore. Um, it's not about just knowing the laws of the game. You've got to understand the game. And uh, Pierluigi Kalina made us understand the game and it was Thiago who was the smallest player from Bayern Munich. In the first leg of that they were playing Barcelona, he was the smallest player and he was blocking players um, PK in particular and um, he showed us six or seven incidents from the first leg when I was refereeing the second leg and it gave us the tools to, 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 to work out how I could solve these issues and where the best referees in the world are the ones that are proactive and solve everything before it happens uh, the ones that aren't the best referees are the ones that are reactive and deal with it um, and that's not what makes a good referee anymore you know you can deal with penalties but that comes with criticism. If you give penalties or you give red cards, one team's going to be upset and one team's going to be happy. But actually, if you solve everything before it happens, you keep both. You, you keep everybody happy, or you try to, which is always a difficult job as a referee. So Kalina gave us all the, the tools um, and as much as he could to be able to understand football, and that's why he was and still is, in my eyes, one of the best referees ever, ever to be. Um, in, in, in modern football and possibly in any football he was he was by far the best referee and I tried to get maybe 5% of his skill sets I couldn't referee like him uh, I know Howard Webb tried to by shaving his hair but I couldn't be anywhere like him so I just decided you know what I'll try and understand the game of football and you know what it helped us massively in the last few years of my career and that's why I became so successful it wasn't because um, okay, there was a lot of hard work, fitness, and um, my movement was probably one of the best in the world at that time. But um, he made us understand football. And when you get into players' heads, because players will do it to you, once you get into their heads, you become so successful because players are thinking, what's going to happen next? Um, and when you get when you get like that with players, um, your game becomes so easy. 
when we're talking about the, the big games like that, and obviously, look, you know, my concern is with sort of the well-being and, and mental toughness and resilience around refereeing. Um, obviously, I like probably many who are listening to this and, and watching this. I read your recent piece or, or a recent piece, certainly about some of the things you'd said in relation to some of the, the big games you'd had and about the pressure that social media had, had kind of put on you around that time and how ultimately it led to you not being able to have memories of of sort of the play during the, the big games, certainly in 2016, where you had that series of, of great finals that you got appointed to successively. I just, I, what I kind of wanted to ask about that was, what what do you, what, what do you feel that you would have done differently now when you took, when you obviously you talk about those nerves traveling and things like that, what do you think you'd have been able to do differently to, to sort of actually now be able to have the memories? I think, that it's always good afterwards because you can analyze and you can possibly enjoy it a lot more now that i've finished referee and it's it gives you a chance to reflect and it is a sadness that when you're involved in it the pressures are so so big and i've said this many times before the modern day referee unfortunately is under more pressure than they've ever been um if you think back to when possibly the premier league when i first got on the premier league 15 years ago um, we didn't have spider cams, we didn't have ultra HD, we didn't have uh, 40 cameras at every game. Um, so, um, yes, it has its advantages that if you make a decision that nobody believes, that you hope that a camera can pick it up. But the, the, the way modern football is now, you've got cameras that referees will never, ever get that viewing angle and most of the time it's behind the goal and unfortunately referees never get that camera angle and it becomes very very difficult uh, the pace of the game's got a lot faster um, but it is with sadness because um, you know the pressures when when I first started refereeing was enjoyable um, yes it was a profession but it wasn't as serious as it is now I think um, the financial side of it's gone up Therefore, the responsibilities and if ever, everyone involved in football becomes high, including referees, and um, the fitness levels went up. Um, you know, and the social media side was zero. So, therefore, you know, if you knew you had had a good game, I used to, because I, I used to always laugh at this, I used to get a mark in the newspaper on a Monday. And I used to think, yes, I used to turn the paper upside down. So, I got a nine instead of a six. <laughs> <laughs> Things like that. And that was the only way you knew through a journalist if you, you had a half decent game, if you got a seven or eight, and you think, oh, that, that's all right. Or you didn't get criticized in the newspaper. And now, and that newspaper disappeared. It disappeared at Whitby Beach, you know, with the fish and chips. So therefore, it was gone. Um, but now, with the way the, the web and social media got developed, there's no hiding place and it stays in, it stays there forever. So your family can read it. Um, and it become really, really difficult to deal with. Um, and when you have good games, um, it's really easy, but you're still getting criticised. Even if you make the decision correct, you're upsetting one team or the other. Um, and there's just so many keyboard warriors that um, if if you read it, and unfortunately, everybody likes to have a peek because everybody wants praise, um, especially in refereeing because it's a soulless task. You know, you don't get very much praise. You, 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 you're searching for praise, but then 99% um, of it is, is just vile trolling and uh, you're having to deal with that um, because there's so much negativity. When you get older, you deal with it a bit easier because you get a bit more experience and you, you become a little bit more more relaxed about it. But when, you, when you're pushing yourself to try and be the best you can be, um, you know, you just... You, you just get trolled over the, the smallest things and, um, you know, and, and some death threats when you, when you make a decision that you, you think is even right. Um, and even over the Auburn McKell incident, um, where I was accused of being a racist, still people still believe it's true. And because Chelsea accused us, the football fans of Chelsea will still believe it, even though I think everybody knows it's, it was completely false. And, you know, the, things always live with you. So you have to deal with it. And, you know, the psychologists on board now in, in the PGML could they do more? Of course they could. Um, because it's not just the Premier League and the top referees that need it. It's, 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 it's some of the guys below and uh, how 
Um, some even grassroots referees can deal with the abuse that they take because I've been involved in, in just for example, it was about three, four years ago, I did a, I did a game for, no, probably a little bit longer, maybe five years ago, I did a game for a, one of my friends in Sunderland and it was a youth match. <laughs> And some of the abuse I was taking, I just put my whistle down. It was a black one, of course. And I just put it, down. <laughs> put it down on the side of the pitch. And the guy who was giving us abuse, I said, go on the map, you do it, I'm off. I'm not getting paid for this. I'm doing it as a favour. I just refereed a big game in the Premier League. And I just started walking off. And it had, to be fair, everybody ganged up on the guy and told him to leave. You know, and, But I'm thinking, what about this guy who's a young referee who hasn't got the skill sets to be able to deal with it like me? Mm. Um now, the abuse was just un unreal and you think but most of the parents you know they, they, they want something for their for their sons and daughters that they weren't so therefore they shout and scream at the sons the other teams the referees and it's just frustration and it's a society issue and unfortunately you're never going to change it because there's so much jealousy um, and people still abuse me now for having me tattoos having a car having a nice house you know, having nice clothes or oh, Mark Glattenberg's got hair, you know, he, he's, he, you know, he shouldn't have, he's a referee. What is it? Somebody tell me what is a modern, what is a referee? What is a referee supposed to look like? You know, people have a stereotypical image of a referee. Yeah. <laughs> with a beard and you weren't allowed a beard. With, you're certainly not allowed a beard. You weren't allowed a beard. And <laughs> no, that's true. Not under the Ellery regime. But you two, beard and tattoos, God, you get nowhere. You two now. You know, I got my, I got reported of David Ellery for having a for having a beard, so you would have no chance. Rock and roll referees. That's what Rock we and are. roll referees. <laughs> Somebody explain to me what is a what is a what is a referee? You know, what because I dress or I know I think it was Rob Jones got criticised recently for yeah. having a hairstyle. What's that all about? What's what's I got to do with it? A hairstyle? Who cares? Um, but unfortunately, these trolls. You know, have a, a you know, I'm not allowed to speak. For example, people said to me, "Go, oh, you're a Jordy." But well, what are the expectancies? I'm, I live in the northeast. I've lived in the northeast all my life. Do, what do they want us to speak like? Um, but people don't even hear you, um, and they have this perception of you from watching you on TV. And it's like an actor in Coronation Street. They're different to how they are in their work, in their normal lives. You know, I'm dealing with multi-millionaires, and if I try to act like I did with my mates, I wouldn't survive. So I've got to find a way to manage these multi-millionaires and people just have this perception of you on TV that you're arrogant and they can have that perception of us, but I'm one of the least arrogant people you'll meet. Obviously, you've got a wife and you've got kids and things and, and that must be a big concern when you get in sort of abuse and things like that. But, but I also want to look at it from the other side of obviously being a family man as you are to have a lot of time like obviously we talked about 2016 where you had a, a really strong season and you've done a lot of games and you did the, the cup final and then you were off to the Euros and you've done the Champions League final as well obviously when you when you had that time away and maybe even earlier in your career as you were coming through the levels when you had maybe a difficult game and for example you were at Southampton or Portsmouth and it was a long way back and, and you were maybe struggling or agonising over one thing or another when you have that distance to travel and you maybe don't exactly have the, the warmth of your family immediately after a game, how, how kind of difficult is that? Yeah, my wife knew. She knew that by my voice the first the minute I got back to the hotel after the game to, to, pick, to collect my car and then head back home. She knew in my voice, um, if I was low or, or high. Or, um, and because I... I was one of the senior referees. I refereed most of the big games, so therefore it had its responsibilities, unfortunately, that you had to deal with. And, uh, you know, you, one of the hardest things is is driving home after a game when you know you've you've made a mistake. And, uh, you know, it doesn't take 10 people to tell you that you've made a mistake. So you, you're analysing the mistake. And you're driving, trying to drive your car, and half the time you're in autopilot because you just can't, you know, rewinding the game in your head, thinking, what could I have done different? Why did I do that? Um, and that's before you even watch the video back, um, either that night or the next day. And um, it's hard thinking, well, why did I do that? Why did I do that? And, and it's it, it's really difficult. And you, you're driving along and you're thinking, oh, my God, I've just drove 40, 50 miles and not even thought about it. I'm just <laughs> still an autopilot. And, yeah. You know, that's, that's something that you've got to be careful of, especially, you know, being able to deal with it because you've got to concentrate on driving. Um, but mm -hmm. referees aren't like players who get... Um, a coach home and 
you know, the pump and looked after and get a flight home. Referees have to travel by themselves. So you've got to analyze them. And I never used to, I tried to avoid uh, chat shows, um, football chat shows afterwards because most of the fans were just going to be negative. You never, you never hear a fan coming on saying that referee was great. Um, most of the time they were just going to come on and criticize. So I try to avoid all that and put music on and try to, try to chill and try to, to clear my mind again because unfortunately it's like riding a bike you, you fall off it and you've got to get back on it again the following week and uh you, you've got to try and move on from your mistakes and improve from your mistakes ready for the following week and you know it's really really difficult but my family were always supportive my wife would leave us alone after a game and never come anywhere near us when i got back home and um because she knew i needed my time to analyze it and quickly move on sundays were a bad day i was always in a bad mood um even if I had a good game, I would still be wanting to improve and push myself even more. So Sundays were a bad day. And then Mondays were reasonable days till I got the appointments at four o'clock and then I would be up or I would be down. <laughs> so it was like a roller coaster every week of motions. And, you know, sometimes it really, got, really, really got you down. And, you know, and I was lucky I got out before the VAR or I would have been never at home of European matches, English matches. And, yeah. It's the hardest bit being able to manage your family time, but my family was really good. I had, I've got a son, eighteen year old. He probably got more exposed to me refereeing than my daughter. My daughter just thinks it's funny that I'm on TV, uh, <laughs> working for, for for various companies, and they find it. She finds it funny, but me probably son would be a boy. Probably gets it, got exposed to it a bit more, and you know he he used to just laugh. He used to just laugh about it, but. You know, I don't know what impact it had on him at school if I'd made a mistake, but I read an article, you know, I've spoken to Lee, Lee Mason after he got abused by the, the Wolves manager and it, it impacts and, and I know what he means by that when, when a manager comes out and says something negative. You know, it, it is hard for, for your children on the school playground because they are going to get um, exposed because unfortunately there's no hiding place with the media anymore. You know, there's newspapers now the, the internet, the news, the news flashes that you get on your mobile phone now are just every, every two minutes. Um, so therefore, there's no hiding place for a modern day referee. And unfortunately, that's the hardest thing. And you've got to protect your family. Um, and I used to protect them. My wife never used to come to games other than the big finals, only because she wanted the free hospitality. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know what, class? So I, I'm really glad you touched on it. It's almost accidental, but it happens a lot on these blogs. Is Every time I talk to you, you always mention your family. And, and you mention about like the challenges you have. And there's a misconception out there with managers and players that referees don't care if they make a perceived mistake. And like you touched on, you always you did so well because you'd always pushed yourself and you always want to critique. But we've talked about the importance of family on there. And, and you know, I did want to flash up that you, you, you are a big family man and people don't see referees as having that sort of life. They just see this person in the black, yellow or whatever kit. And, uh, and think we're all fair game? Yeah, it's not a family. Without your family and strong family, you can't achieve successful men. Need a, need a woman behind them to protect them and look after them and make my life easy. She didn't make me boots. She didn't wash me boots. That was one thing she refused. <laughs> but she always put, like made sure that my life was easy. If I was going away in Europe on a Monday and I'd been in the Premier League on a Saturday, I only had Sunday off. Monday I was travelling, game Tuesday, back Wednesday. That used to happen a lot for me. So especially in my latter part of my career because I was refereeing 13, 14 European matches a season. So therefore I was very rare at home. So she managed she managed the family. I remember going to my very first tournament um, with FIFA and she was pregnant to, uh, for my daughter, Mia, back in 2011. Um, she's due to give birth and um, I'm panicking because... I'd been told I was going to go and uh, referee in the under 20, uh, under 20 World Cup in Colombia. And you know that refereeing, if you don't take the opportunity, somebody else will. Um, and how was adamant? I'm like to my wife, I need to go. And she's like, yeah, I support you, but I'm pregnant. It's, me for, it's your daughter. You want to be there for the for the birth. And the amount of curries I give her, I give her all sorts. <laughs> and uh, eventually she give birth one week before going to Colombia. But you can imagine... The phone call after three weeks, um, I had a good tournament. And after three weeks, I was told that I was staying. And that phone call, I'm high because I'm in my first tournament and not many English referees got retained in tournaments for years. Ellery failed, Durkin failed, Gallagher failed, Riley failed, Paul failed. 
very rare referees got retained in any FIFA tournaments. I know Webb did in 2008, so uh, 2008 and 2010. So it was the start of this this thing. So I didn't want to let anybody down. I didn't want to be a failure. So to get the told that I'd been successful and been retained for the latter stages was a great feeling. But then to ring my wife up, who was just looking after a one week, two week, three week old baby. My God, it was hard, really hard. And, you know, to make that phone call to say, I'm not coming home for another two weeks was one of the hardest phone calls I've had to make. And, you know, that's that's what you needed behind us because she made my tournament successful because I didn't have to worry about anything back home, bearing in mind the time difference and everything else. So, you know, I, I had a good tournament and that probably accelerated my career on uh, because if somebody else had took me place, I might not have had a chance going forward. So you need to take your chances. That's an incredible sacrifice. And I, I mentioned in the podcast a couple of episodes ago that my wife gave birth uh, in November. Obviously, we were during lockdown. I was there for the birth. It was a cesarean. But because of COVID, they kicked me out of the hospital. I didn't see them for two days. And and for you to say it was weeks after your your, your baby was born that you, you didn't get that time, that's it just really hit home the amazing sacrifice that you had to do to 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 progress in refereeing at, at the cost there. <laughs> I just wanted to, to, to say as well there, um, you mentioned these these massive fixtures that came your way. Um, I wanted to talk about not not the tournament ones, because obviously you, you feel if you're having a good tournament and you you, you would stay and progress on. But the, the things like the, the Champions League final, how do you get that news? So I, sh- I assume it's not like cold, like an email or nothing like that. But on the other end, I don't expect it's like a golden dove that comes down with this scroll that says, <laughs> here's your fixture, Mr. Clattenburg. Where, where in that scale is, is how do you get that news? Great shows. You buy a, you buy a Willy Wonka chocolate bar and you walk <laughs> All the upper lumpers come out. Oh, leave me out of this. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing because in December, so if we go back to 2015, in December, I was on my way to do Chelsea Leicester, uh, Leicester Chelsea. And um, it was a pretty cold night in Leicester. I think my video got the sack that day, if I recall rightly. And uh, oh, after the match, they got, Chelsea lost 2 0. And I got a phone call on the way to the stadium from Pierre Luigi Kalina. When Kalina rings you, it's like, your phone double vibrates, so therefore you're like, okay, there go. And I'm on my way to the game, and I'm like, keep me, he said, can you keep it quiet? It's getting released tomorrow. You're going to be going to the Euros. And I'm like, fucking hell, I'm about to referee Chelsea Leicester. Yeah, I'm, and to be fair, I ran around like Billy Wiz. I was like, on, <laughs> on. Um, so to get that phone call to that, know that you're going to be a part of the Euro Championships from being an additional referee for Howard in Poland and Ukraine in 2012 to be a referee in 2016 especially with all the pressures because there was some pressures on that. You know, Atkinson, Martin Atkinson was, you know, probably the FA's first choice and um, I did what I had to do and I didn't concentrate on anybody else. I just concentrated on my thing, got fit, got fitter, tried to get better, get me fit, you know, my movement, tried everything um, and I concentrated on my own game and lucky enough I was chosen. So that started the the, the move going forward and then, um, for the for the Euro Championship uh, for the Champions League final, I'm in the car going down to, uh, to St George's for the for the for the select group meeting, and uh, I get to take a phone call. And what was bizarre was I didn't expect this phone call f- to be a referee because I'd refereed the semi final in the Champions League and I did uh, by Atletico Bayern, really really successful first leg, no issues, no controversies. Um, Guardiola was the coach of Bayern uh, so it was absolutely you know no issues um, no criticism everybody happy after the match Pierre Luigi sent us a message congratulating me performance and it's over my season's over great done thanks very much thanks lads let's have a beer because the season's over you don't do a semi-final in a final it's never heard of and then uh, it was about three days before the the announcement Um it was said in the Spanish newspaper that um, my good friend Jonas Eriksson was going to referee from Sweden. And I was like, wow, there's no official announcement, but I'm so happy for him because he deserved it. He's a great referee, great guy, experienced, liked him a lot. And I'm thinking if I can be fourth official because Kalina knew I was good friends with him. So I'm hoping I can be fourth official to him. You know, what a great thing is family, my family get together in Milan. I love Milan as a city. 
Um, I'm thinking because I've refereed the finals, there's absolutely no chance. And took the phone call and uh, stopped because when cleaning rings, like I said, double ring tone, <laughs> you stop. And I pulled up onto the um, lay by, pulled up, took his phone call, and he just uh, said, uh, Congratulations on the FA Cup final. Um, you're going to be, re- um, would you like to go to Milan? And I'm like, I would love to go to Milan. Um, I'll be delighted to be fourth official at Jonas Eriksson thinking that Jonas had the game you know and he went no you're not, you're not going to be fourth official you're going to be refereeing I'm like stop taking the piss you know what I mean <laughs> says, what did you just say and I went I was talking with Jordy and I ended up having to speak a bit better English and I was like <laughs> of course I'd be on it you know and, and it was bizarre because going back to emotions yeah, I was high as a kite absolutely high as a kite and I ring with my wife there's like her first words is not congratulations her words were Fucking hell, what outfit can I get? Shoes am I going to wear? So she didn't understand. And then I started reading the guys up because I work with a team. And I got warned, uh, I got told that um, Andre Mariner, who was one of my additionals, was on holiday. So what I did was I privately got everybody together because we couldn't tell anybody till five o'clock that evening till the press release. So I pulled all the guys to one side and I said uh, to to Simon Beck, who was my number two at the time. Simon, you know, congratulations, we're going to go into the Champions League final. Everybody was like, what? Everybody was saying, did Jake Collins started crying? Because he was new to the team and he was like, wow, what a roller coaster this is. You know, Champions League final. And then I spoke to Anthony Taylor and then Andre Marin. I was like, I said to Andre, Andre, unfortunately you can't be me addition in the Champions League final because you want an holiday. He went, I'm not, I'm not, I'm cancelling my holiday. So he, uh, <laughs> so I had to tell you where for that he was available. And then I had a train. I had a train with St. Joy, I couldn't see anything. And it was bizarre because I was so happy that I was being given this uh, final. And I went training, couldn't see anything. And I was like, Billy Wiz. Everybody was like, wow, he's training probably the best he's ever trained. And I was running around and, you know, Riley didn't even know, nobody knew. Um, and then at four o'clock, I went up to my room after training, got myself a coffee and just waited for Sky Sports News. And then at five o'clock, it came across the ticket bar and my phone just went crazy. Um, and then to be fair, I went downstairs to the dining room at six uh, when we had with dinner at six o'clock and everybody stood up and clapped. And even Martin Atkinson, who was my arch rival, even stood up and clapped. So respect and, uh, you know, totally. to be given that Champions League. Finals. But then reality kicks in, you know, you think, shit, I've got to referee the, the Champions <laughs> League final. You know, all the, all the accolades and all the nice messages, you're then thinking, oh my God, I've got to actually referee it. <laughs> what a game as well, the Madrid derby. What absolute yeah. top draw. Yeah, no. it wasn't bad Madrid because, yeah. you know, it works out well because Real Madrid and Atletico Madrid was probably the perfect final for me because I'd had Madrid Atletico twice in that tournament previously and both games went really well. So they were happy with my appointment. Real Madrid were happy because they always, they always played well and won. So I think it was a dream final for myself because I had both clubs actually wanting us to do the final, probably not afterwards, but certainly before. What you do, obviously, Leisure League's ambassador, like we said, and you, you've been to two of the uh, International Soccer Federation's World Cups now, which, which oh, the lads just love having you around, and it's just a very different vibe, and it's very hands-on, and because of what happens with, um, with your connection with Portugal, really, with Ronaldo, in, in Lisbon in the first World Cup, I, I was shocked how many times you were just recognised, even when we would have, I think we were getting some chips early hour of the morning, we won one game and they wanted all to take selfies with you. And it was incredible, absolutely incredible experience. I, I liked how you said the chips, you forgot about the alcohol, probably. <laughs> <laughs> you just crashed us up, mate. thanks for that. <laughs> but no, it's, you know, it was incredible for Portugal to win that Euros, you know, and they were, you know, they never won a, they never even won a game in the group stage, they drew every match and then, you know, they practically drew nearly every match other than the semi-final. Um, the one on penalties and stuff. So I think it was amazing that they beat the French team and, you know, having the first tournament. But what I have to say, you know, I've been working with Leisure League the last few years and, you know, it's a great company um, for, for you know, grassroots and the, the small side of football. It's incredible what they're doing, you know, nationally. Unfortunately, because of the COVID, everything's under restrictions at the moment. But once COVID's end, you know, it's an amazing way to go and play football in a controlled environment because I was shocked how the, the discipline towards the referees and how good leisure leagues make it to, to, for, for players and referees to be in a safe environment is incredible. And for me to be a part of that, and even 
going to referee, to referee in my first tournament in Lisbon in the World Cup was unbelievable. I couldn't believe we've got to have a football stadium in the square in Lisbon. It was just breathtaking and unbelievable. And it even got better in Crete uh, mm-hmm. two years ago. Two years ago, one year ago, one year ago. One year ago, and, man. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was incredible to you know, have a, a stadium, an even better stadium on the beach. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the tournament itself, the skills, um, the crowds popularity of it um, and even the quality of refereeing and the players were just exceptional and to be a part of two World Cups um, uh, it was like really really special and well organised and I can't wait for the next one to be fair Martin and I'm hoping the next one will be even better and um, and I'm sure it will be um, because uh, Lisbon was really good, excellent Crete went to another level so what's the next one and um, for referees to come worldwide and learn from people's experiences more we'll learn from each other's experiences I still learn every day um, I watch referees here in Greece and I learn from them all the time and uh, you know to see different styles of referee and, and everybody coming together as a family um, and that's the most important thing you know refereeing and football should you know in a, in a great environment in a, in a friendly environment it's, it's, it's really enjoyable and you know it's nice to referee without getting um, criticism on Twitter, which is uh, which is all. <laughs> it was it's pretty me. I remember we were um, we were up late, not drinking alcohol again, with the American managers and that, not drinking alcohol again in this lovely bar that didn't serve alcohol. And you were just chatting away, and it was just it, it, you. I don't even think you 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 know it, mate. This is probably why you did so well. It's when you talk and your your passion. There we are. It's, it's an essentially a, it's a World Cup for amateur players, and even in the rules it says they're all amateur. And you got these managers, and one was from America, and one of the American lads was also from England. One of both of them were from England, actually, but live in America. And the way you were talking to them, and the way they engaged, and it's just great to see you giving that that bit back to that level of football, mate. It really, it really is great to see. Yeah, like you know, I've been a referee, and you know, stopped. I didn't stop in Saudi. Um, I still refereed in Saudi. And then I went to China and completely just refereed, which was great. Um, I didn't have any of the management side of it, any of the stresses. Um, coming to Greece is, is, a different, is a different level and um, because I'm in, in control of the whole referee inside of it from, from the top level to grassroots, which is something new to us. It's, you know, the management side of refereeing is completely different to being a referee where you're in control with your black whistle and your black kit when you go on the pitch, you're not in control when you're a manager. You're actually, you've actually got a, you know, you, you, you're in, you're in, you're relying on other people to do the job successfully. And I can only pass on my experiences. I pass on. And the biggest, the biggest uh, tips I give to referees here in Greece is just be fair and be balanced. Give, give. If you're balanced in all your decisions, um, and not two wrongs don't make a right, but give what you give for one team, you give to the other, you'll get more respected and accepted. And um, this is one of the biggest things I pass on because um, if you if you whistle four or five decisions against one team and two of them are wrong, you'll always get criticised and you've got to find a way to, the best, the most successful referees are the ones that, you know, find the way to, to balance the matches in the best way under the laws of the game and the spirit of the game. So I just try and pass on my experiences Am I learning every day as a boss? Yeah, of course. I learn every day. Um, I learn how the Greek reality, the Greek way, and the Greek football, and the Greek football is very special. I can't wait for the fans to come back into the stadiums because Olympiagos, Panathinaikos, Pauk, Aris, um, Ike, all these clubs are, have got great fan bases. So I'm looking forward to, to seeing football here in Greece really being played. And But the most important thing at the moment is everybody stays safe because... Unfortunately, this COVID isn't going to go away in the short term. Have you found uh, that there's, like, obviously when you first went to um, Saudi and then obviously you've been to China and you're now in Greece, have you found sort of problems that you, not not necessarily negative problems, but things that uh, are issues that you didn't previously see with, with being on UEFA and FIFA and, and obviously in the Premier League? Yeah, it was, it's a big culture shock because I went to Saudi and you can't drink alcohol. Um, so I had, a, I had a lot of air miles flying to Dubai. <laughs> um, but in reality, it, it, there's no alcohol. So, the, you know, I'm not saying that you need alcohol, but sometimes it's nice to be able to socialise and just 
get away from from football. And so, and Saudi was different because a lot of the clubs owned by the royal families or and um, part of the, the the you know the the government or so there was a lot of politics and a lot of you know the referees were um, you know good referees but was trying to develop them but the quickly the government changed and wanted foreign referees so I was just appointing foreign referees and my job was so difficult trying to appoint foreign referees and um, it was a full time full time job so I didn't have the time to imp- give me input into into the domestic referees and I was refereeing as well and. After two years of being in Saudi, my contract was coming to an end. I asked us to extend uh, for six months, but I was not in any shape to, to extend. And I knew China China was talking in the background. Saudi was normal. You could eat normal food, but China was a different level. Going to China, it was just completely different. The food uh, preparation, I was I was refereeing every week. I had to referee 35 games from March till end of November. So I was out every week traveling three-hour flights, sometimes from Beijing to Guangzhou. Um, the culture's different, the food for sure. Even before a game, I was never getting the the uh, the food intake that I should be before matches. I was fatiguing very quickly in matches, um, mentally as well, not just physically, because I just wasn't getting the right the right food in that I wanted for my body because, you know, China's completely different. Um, but there were very... Um, very friendly people. I settled in very, very quickly. Met some good friends, the expats. So I had a, I had a great life in China. I really enjoyed China. Um, as a country, they were, it was great. My family enjoyed it. Um, they came for short periods. And, you know, I was settled there. And then, unfortunately, because of the COVID, it ended. The contract ended. We couldn't get visas. And then in the summer, you ever called us to to come to Greece and uh, take over the head of referee and. In Greece, it's a completely different world. Um, so you, you know, great lifestyle. I've got a great life, um, private life. You know, palm near the beach, and you know, Greece is such a great country to to live in. But the football is really, really difficult. Um, very difficult place to to work and and try and become the head of refereeing because unfortunately, refereeing is a really difficult. Um, place in football because everybody wants to blame the referee and it's even worse now in COVID because with COVID owners haven't got the money coming in because of no crowds um, financially they've got huge problems um, and they want to take it out more on the referees so every decision has been scrutinised even more and not, give, not in the past it used to get accepted now there's very little acceptance of any refereeing decisions and that's that's just because of the COVID as well even amplified more uh, because there's no money um, and everybody's under huge pressure for relegations um, and, and the financial getting into the Champions League. So the pressures here is, 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 is bigger than it would have been two years ago. Um, but I like a challenge. I love a challenge in life. And you know, now, even though I'm only 45 years old, people say, can you still referee? And my mindset's completely changed now. I want to become... Uh, more developed in the management skills and pass on all my experiences and and try and become um, you know it's a different chapter in my life and um, it has its own responsibilities and I believe that if I keep learning from me from me pitfalls and me mistakes I'll hope that I can become a successful manager in refereeing as well and I hope but you never know and not all good referees can make good managers so we'll see. Wish you all the best with uh, obviously that coming out of the uh, coronavirus and then hopefully getting Greek football back up to its best and, and the referees there. Yeah, thank you. Now it's a big challenge and it's a one that, you know, we have foreign referees do come into Greece, but only for some of the big games just to take the pressure away from some of the, the Greek referees. Plus, we haven't got enough referees at the moment because of the restrictions and not getting people certified because people don't realise that VAR, the VAR has caused many problems and refereeing because referees cannot referee matches that are VAR operated if they're not certified. And there's a lot of preparation in a referee just to be certified. A lot of hours of training, a lot of on-field uh, live matches, off-line matches. There's a lot of, lot of work and we have 10 new promoted referees in Greece. And unfortunately, not one of them can operate in the Super League because they're not certified and we can't get them certified because of the COVID. So, it's not it's not, it's not an easy task and yeah you know not having crowds in is one blessing for some of the referees but it's not a blessing in other ways
I just want to say um, I, I, what, what a brilliant, brilliant blog this has been. I, having just having someone like you, mean how, how ordinary and real you are. I, I knew, I knew how real you were, but it's just great that it's all just come out so nasty, mate. And it's um, it's been it's been brilliant. And uh, I'm going to pass you over to Anthony because he's got a question he wants to ask about uh, something we're going to do about advertising the, the blog. Oh no, yeah, but before that, I just want to mention uh, a couple of episodes ago um, we had Jerry Gill on former Birmingham City player. And he yeah. said, during a game that was played at Prenton Park, you were the referee there. And he was given some stick and you gave something back. Something along the lines of, how can you be giving me stick when you spend so much time on the sunbed? And he said to you, how can you have a pop at me when you clearly use sunbeds more than I do? I just want to say, are you only in Greece because sunbeds have got so expensive that you're just cutting out the middleman and getting the sun in? I was told they were uh, harmful, so I thought, you know what, well, let's just get the proper sun. But uh, <laughs> brilliant! It's either Seam, it's either Seam in County Durham or Athens. Come on! There it is. I've been to Seam and Athens, and I can testify, Mark's definitely made the right decision. Anyway, fellow Jordan, you should stick up for Seam. Yeah, you <laughs> just. <laughs> I've lived in Greece for a couple of years as well. I'll just say, stay away from the fried cheese because that will just. I used to be like seven stone, but the, <laughs> that fried <laughs> cheese really gets you and the gyros. Is that why you put the camera from your head up so you can't see it? That's camera. it. If I lean back, it's just it's tits and belly. So <laughs> 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 that's that's how COVID's got me. I've just I've not exercised and I've eaten lots of fried cheese and kebabs. Yeah. And I've only got a suntan from the lights on the fridge. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, the beer. <laughs> yeah. To win the signed T-shirt, you've got to comment a magic word in the comments afterwards. But Mark's just got to pick out a magic word, any word you want, mate. Don't say a <laughs> we don't want that one. But any word <laughs> you want, and, we, and that's the magic word we've got to put in. Tattoos. Ooh, that's amazing. Interesting. Beauty, beauty. You love that, mate. Sound. So if you've been watching this podcast, comment the word tattoos. That'll put you into the prize draw to win the Mark Clattenburg signed shirt. How Mark- many tattoos do I have? That's the question. Ooh. Ooh. Well, I like, that. I like that. A bonus. But I'll tell you what, and if you get that right, we'll throw in from our from our partners leisure leagues we'll throw in a signed yellow and red card uh, signed by Mark Lattenberg to see how many tattoos he's got there you go Addis Gravy well, I Glatt- need to get the final whistle tattoo should I get the final whistle tattoo no. yes mate we'll all do it we'll all go out and not drink alcohol and get tattoos <laughs> absolutely brilliant absolutely brilliant well listen that's the final whistle seven, episode 17 with the incredible Mark Lattenberg thank you for listening Make sure it's your last one. Thanks. Cheers.